Hello everyone, today we talk about Timurid, Kazakh and Uzbek warfare from the 14th to the 16th century. Wow, like, you know, th this is huge, right? And uh, you cannot, of course, simply approach um, topics like these all together. Reason for which I always repeat that these videos are just introductory and as I've proven you for, for years, I actually do um, everything in detail um, eventually. Uh, and there are already, in fact, some videos made on this topic in, in some depth, right? Um, we talked about the Timurids. We looked at least at Central Asian warfare, more or less, throughout this time. Admittedly, not so much um, about the, the, the last um, centuries of the Middle Ages. But we've seen enough about the White Ship Turks, about the Ilkhanids, um, about um, just a Renaissance warfare. Uh, in general, admittedly, even there, not much Central Asian stuff, but um, there is an entire playlist about uh, the Mongols, and there is surely uh, more than just a connection between these topics and what we have already seen. And indeed, we could make it relatively easy uh, if we stuck to the obvious notion that these armies were fundamentally following the traditional pattern of the Turco-Mongolian ones as far as this, you know, uh, uh, ultra-elite, right, uh, dominating on swarms of um, subjects, mostly fielding uh, horse archers, where we're going about uh, subjugating uh, each other, harassing uh, the sedentary civilizations. But there is more that we have fortunately been able to appreciate looking at the history of the steppes, in this specific sta um, uh, series, um, as far as the, the gradual transformation uh, of the same uh, are concerned, that is to say, the gradual and especially the the centuries start being crucial weakening uh, of the steps. Right, uh, this is where it becomes cool because um, I will not be repeating myself regarding, but the, the bias that we have been maturing in the West, especially in the last uh, half century or so, regarding this terrible, strange kind of Eastern uh, warrioristic force that is superior to civilization. It's never been an actual thing, right? Uh, we have um, overestimated dramatically the capacities of... Um, if anything, we have radically underestimated the capacities of, of the West, first of all, and a bit the, the, of, of civilization with capital C, that, of course, we can uh, call like the same, you know, other civilizations, not just the Western one. Um, and that, however, uh, cannot, um, say, eliminate either the, of course, the threat, the, the problems, the, the general instability and damage to civilization that um, these peoples uh, carried out. Right, damage also, I'm talking about now, from a military historical point of view, but if you think about that, and also as far as the Indo-European identity is concerned, and our broader, say, you could say daily values, at least the ones that conservatively re remain, at least as far as it was normality um, uh, a few decades ago, really have their roots uh, in maybe not just the step per se, but definitely a world that was deeply inspired by the same values that fundamentally overlapped more or less uh, all over the world uh, in all what we call religions plurally, even though it was quite clear to, to anyone living back then that there was only one possible uh, belief. Um, and I will not digress on this either, but you know, I've made plenty, plenty of videos about uh, history of religions for that matter, especially as far as war, holy war is concerned. Um, so um, this is yet like another kind of anthropological topic that I'm not going to digress on today. But um, this period, like the late medieval and early modern um, uh, time, is the one in which the tides turn for good as far as the probably the prevalence of uh, the sanitary civilizations over the steppes peoples are concerned because you literally start having the sanitaries taking over the steppes, right? This will be uh, clearer in, in the uh, following episodes of this series. Um, but um, the, um, the evidence that the same steps were at this point 
basically being overrun even just before militarily but culturally by the sanitaries is is self-evident in other words the time in fact of the horse archer were um if not over because it would still take some time arguably you know we 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 have seen uh, the, the step remaining like this up to the very last centuries uh, in many ways together with traditional warfare um aside from minor adjustments not even gunpowder is actually the deal there right uh, as always technology is zero doctrine is is everything per se um but um in general we see a uh, a stabilization also of the same uh, steps uh, arms and armor towards an ever in fact increasing uh, sanitary uh, uh, source right and the consequence modification of the same steps uh, political and social systems uh, at that point we've seen already how this started happening we can say that the the epic say the the heroic phase of the steps world um surely not over with the indo-europeans but the sense that there was almost an alternative world um that uh, could still maintain in force especially the concept of individual um effectiveness um even at the detriment of the collective one but still with that kind of closer understanding of um of traditional order um was brought down by uh the the turks right at, or at least the turks were the product of the collapse of the indo-european world and they came in fact to invest a step that had unbalanced itself that actually w- would not be more prosper than it had been before and so even the great mongol epopee later on um and uh, the one of the the hairs of of this of the kingiz empire we will see today is just like um like a bit the, the history of the same senator civilization always running after the um the unitary ideal but being ever more distant from it in 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 the frame of the, the fall of mankind right in the gradual degeneration of of the system um that however was reinforcing instead from from the steps in a way that also was becoming more, more modern more secular but that in terms of power at least and so traditionally was um more uh more effect in taking over the same uh cradles of the the idea of that same tradition if you want now in the 70s of the 14th century uh the states of the king gizids uh so we're essentially looking at uh the the golden horde in eastern europe and transuralia and the uh chagatai's ulus in central asia and what is today's kazakhstan basically were shattered to their foundations right this happened less than a century after the, the end of the unitary um empire right these um powers had fundamentally managed to carve uh their own space um uh, during uh, exactly the same the fragmentation of the same they had been competing with one another they still in different proportions kind of collected this historical legacy you know the golden horde and the kazakh um power were, were mostly um turkic if you really look at them in at least in sostratum um the chagatai ulus was at least the closest that um at least the the the, the primitive lifestyle of the king gizid power had been but in a very different place from mongolia as well so you realize that today we'll not talk about china and what had been going on there because the nomads represented always a threat uh for the empire for, for very late in time but if you look at the majority of eurasia and especially this great um uh western crescent from let's say the, the baltic to um to to india you can you can say you you realize that um the broader turkic mongol empire is giving way right and it's being properly uh at a time crushed um on in open field right uh, such as at kulikovo 
uh, or uh, well, you know, in other battles that uh, say are less famous, but the creed right among these peoples, like the you know the the rise or fall or this or that clan and the general destabilization of of, of these powers uh, on the longer run. Um, the um, surely the, the military dimension acquires a central. Um, uh, relevance as much as the aforementioned contact with the, the senators as well, right? Because the most prosper future of these powers is not even um, is not based uh, anymore on the, on the step per se, but as the Timurids, as the Mughals later um, exemplified, it was about fundamentally um, a broader sense of, of overlordship and capacity of these elites of of grafting themselves on pre-existing uh, civilizational um, uh, basins, such as Persia, uh, India, um, and so on, right? So we, we've seen in the previous video how, for example, the same Golden Horde was quite precarious uh, in balance, uh, even against the, 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 the subjects, uh, her, her own subject in the West. Now, in these lines, uh, legitimate cans from the House of uh, Gingits, uh became mere puppets in the hands of the Amirs, first of all, which already shows the uh, how precocious and fast... I mean, before getting that, uh, say, I don't know, in uh, in Roman history or in many other empires, like, it has to pass a consistent amount of time. These powers were evidently less solidly based. The Mongol invasions had been clamorously successful in, a, in an extensional sense, but obviously they had had to immediately rely uh, on on the subjects uh, to a degree that was early evidencing the, the incapacity once the system was broken um, uh, in, you know, at home, right? So the, the, the deterrent capacity of keeping up with this uh, objectively exhausting, in fact, um, demands, right, of, of this, this capacity of projecting massive armies, very well uh, equipped by way and supported, so with, with an enormous coast uh, all across Eurasia, could not go on uh, for too long. After all, these peoples, we have observed that, were, generally speaking, searching, like, carrying out these this conquests because they wanted to leave... Um, at least, maybe they didn't. They wouldn't rationalize it like like that. But fundamentally, becoming richer, right? Settling in a fertile, powerful land, right? There was nothing, say, national in the sense of, okay, we should simply leave as you know. We we have always been living in Central Asia because that's basically the only thing that matters. Of course, they were incredibly, um, say, say they were very open-minded people from one side but from the other they they, they had been knowing on, only that kind of lifestyle so again maybe they wouldn't rationalize the, the this continuous sense uh, this continuous need of expansion just because they needed to to settle ultimately in another place compared to their own um, but it was evident at the same time that um, that power deriving from the conquest of other countries was per se still compatible with their own traditional knowledge. That's always been the same thing. That's what basically the world has forgotten in a couple of hundred years, that um, land per se has no value, right? Uh, it is the actual power of, of say, of humans g given uh, to a specific leader that counts, right? And um, the, say, chthonic superstition for which you just have to die for a piece of of, of of earth of dirt as a matter of fact given that human literally means dirty etymologically speaking per se is exactly the measure of the failure of mankind in front of the in front of transcendence in front of the capacity of taking over the entirety of the universe and not just a, a portion of that and that's the measure to which of course um, say humanity has sunk to this point with complete um, essentially denial of any traditional foundation. Now, um, when we look at the Golden Horde, uh, so to appreciate how, say, um, the King Gizzard dynasty, so in theory, the, the one that had 
come the closest to divine unity and so would have had to allegedly belong to a, to, div- to a divine stock or at least the closest um, available, you immediately realize that they had uh, lost power quite quickly. Mamai, in the Golden Horde, was not a can, but fundamentally a kingmaker, was the effective ruler over the, in fact, the, the, the cans from the Uls of Yuchen. Um, the same can be said for uh, Timur, in the, for, for the Uls of, of, of Chagatai. Right. What is interesting, by the way, is that all these, um, um, let's say, king makers, let's call, let's call them this way, uh, were, of course, aggrandizing themselves on the base of a uh, traditional ethnic and, in fact, also properly military legacy. Um, you know that Timur's background, for example, is debated. He surely had all the, you know, uh, Turkic, Mongol, and Iranian background that, that you can imagine, but he would choose some specific, say, um, uh, aspect, at least of of, of all these various identities alternatively to stress this or that aspect of his power. We also know a few about these people, generally speaking, right? Um, the Timurid Empire became, you know, one of the, right from the Ajan to, to Delhi, uh, one of the most uh, impressive uh, uh, between the, the 14th and, and the 15th century. It basically um, um, uh, crashed uh, Ottoman power that you know the Europeans could have at that point easily finished um, uh, finished off um, reawoken th- this idea of uh, say a possible alliance in fact of the let's say well, of the Mongols uh, with uh, Europeans as far as this in fact other Islamic powers in in Levant um, were were concerned um, I made actually multiple videos about uh, Timurid politics and, and warfare, so you can look at those in mostly Mo- the Mongol history playlist or right around there. Um, and um, you can understand how, um, let's say, changing the the nature of these powers really were. Steps peoples that fundamentally reestablished themselves in outer regional um, basins. Again, always the same pattern they begin to use ever greater amount of, of sanitary forces, uh, artillery, um, infantry, for that matter, too. So even if their outlook has always some um, traditionally steppish, let's say, kind of um, uh, of essence, the, um, the times, the, the fact that the times were changing, that these empires were just like, Emerging and gen- eventually falling again after a while was uh, it is striking, right? And historically, uh, you have uh, the thresholds of the modern age essentially a, um, uh, an international balance that more or less stabilizes without many of these adventures uh, much anymore. You basically, have the Ottomans, you have the Safavids, you have the Mughals, um, and that's pretty much it. Right, the rest, at least we look at from from a Western Eurasian perspective, the steps are gradually confined in their own, uh, in fact, in their own natural environment, but being even taken over by the sanitaries uh, to a degree. This is particularly evident for for the Rus, for for Siberia. Um, So we will see that uh, at some point, because pike and shot uh, tactics became an insoluble puzzle for the steppes horsemen. Thimmer's figure uh, is particularly fascinating um, and uh, shrouded in that level of, say, the, the balance of uh, history and, and myth that, however, um, is paralleled by his military accomplishment. He was, uh, again, this is debatable, but we can say he was a Mongol from the Barla tribe by uh, birth, and again, how these tribes were assembled is quite a complicated thing to properly uh, stress, Even ju- uh, just especially the elite was that mobile in, in a way that, um, as always, corresponded to the actual allegiance. This is 
throwing the stamps than in any other place in the world because the system is that unstable that if you don't bow yourself totally right to the point of properly recognizing the the um, proto divinity that's like you say of the group that you belong to you you cannot even properly prove to be part of the same because you must believe in that uh, with blind or at least wholly committed faith um, so Timur worked his way up to the position of Amir through uh, through war right um, in three and trees and which are also a bit the meritocratic pinch let's say that you can add actually to, to these people because it doesn't matter how um, surely vertical this uh, the system is right um, it's also relatively easier to rise to the top um, through especially military uh, capacity uh, he then managed to become the ruler of, of the immense empire uh, that we know. His conquests were achieved, uh, however, with a substantially um, um, advanced type of uh, military organization, namely a, a powerful standing army, uh, n supported um, in case of need by tribal levies. So already here we, we realize that there is an increasing uh, wagoning uh, of the military apparatus as it had been going on exactly in the sanitary world here we are after the black death so basically the um, the average uh, world inhabitant was much less likely to uh, essentially put up an, a struggle uh, personally against the affirmation of uh, powerful elites that were the same ones basically ensuring his survival to, to a degree and that's how the thing is is happening you can never distinguish like you know giving away power from sim simply um, somebody taking it uh, away from you it's always your own responsibility and still the system is surely uh, in need of that it's it's a it's a mechanism that uh, triggered by all the moments of crisis and it is necessary in this case exactly to provide for that bulk of m professional and de facto permanent men at arms right we can debate on the concept of permanence you know unfortunately the 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 um the so-called military revolution has caused this um, dramatic damage to the, the narrow cognitive ability of any, you know, of most scholars, I would say, at this point to reason in turn, more open uh, ways than this kind of uh, actually ridiculous firework um, definition or, or approach or method. Um, but um, the, um, the, the sense being that in the steps the, the elite had always been but also in, in the sanitary world the elite had de facto always been in a moment in which was professional um, a full time force right how you would be able to mobilize that is, is a different um, is a different thing there is no doubt but at least a core of troops that can be summoned and during, the, the, I mean, the Timurid campaigns are, are an excellent proof of that. By the way, with a massive logistic apparatus, right? The guy was about to enter China at some point. Uh, he, again, space throughout, he arrived in Anatolia, in the Indus Valley, uh, with, by the way, a consistent amount of artillery, even of elephants, as a point, uh, at a point. So this, this cannot be done without a civilizational stratum. And that stratum is Persia in case you wonder, right, so um, uh, this, uh, you know, very central land indeed as far as civilization and and the steppes, let's say nomadism, um, is, um, is concerned. Uh, that in fact squeezed also uh, dramatically the, the local resources, but that were needed from a sedentary basis, right, um, not just a nomadic predatory one. Um, Nevertheless, the same system would, um, would decline. But the meeting between uh, the Timurids and other uh, competitors, especially the 
hairs of the Mongol Empire is fascinating. Um, because the Timurid system was superior to them, indeed. Right, so you have this um, powerful military apparatus that, in in say f- from the outer side, does, doesn't seem uh, dramatically. If you look at a Timurid army, probably you would be surprised with how similar it was just to a to a Golden Horde one, to some degree. But um, unfortunately, we we weren't there just to film that. In any case, we know that there were lots of other sedentary elements uh, that contributed to the, the the strengthening of this of these forces. Um, the Golden Horde was um, defeated by uh, by Timur during the 80s and uh, the 90s of, of the 14th century. There had been actually a pretty bitter war going on where you do spot the uh, the essential uh, let's say pros and cons of having an empire uh, in fact located in the midst of say in between the, the steppes and, and the sanitary world namely the vast um, spaces uh, where you could basically um, attract uh, the enemy on uh, so sparsely populated in fact in part also steps occupied space uh, with a uh, few important centers you could simply you know take down uh, and still if so right with very stretched supply lines and constant harassment from people that didn't even live in there because they were just you know occupying some uh, open ground some pasture uh, across this vast, vast space uh, and the let's say the same thing per se i mean the fact that the, the power you controlled was that uh let's say uh can't say discontinuous uh but in a geographical sense but at least the fact that it was not so dense to um to counter strike uh the size of like what was the chance of the golden horde right at this point of uh, internal uh balance to strike into persia for example there had been peoples, as we've seen, that were had been capable of doing that. Even even the the Varangians and and the Rus had been able to go as far as Urcania, um, uh, and so on. But um, the 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 power balance of the Golden War by by this point didn't uh, fundamentally allow them to 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 do much. But essentially, having the the Timurids fighting in their own territory in their own home, uh, and even being defeated by the same. And th- to this, together with the uh, victory of Kulikovo by Dmitri, the, the prince um, of the Moscovy, um, and, um, and his allies over the usurper Mamai, who had himself split, in that sense, the Golden, the, the golden Horde as such, um, uh, were um, essentially the uh, the cause, and also partly the consequence of the same um, Golden Horde weakening. So that when um, you see uh, the, the way blazing open for to talk Tamish from the house of Genkets to actually reunify the the, the Golden Horde, um, so that. Under his rule, um, she was almost reinstated to her position of former uh, glory and might. But we're talking about a temporary uh, rise that had to do, in fact, also with this internal readjustments. In 1395-96, Timur routed um, Tokhtamish, ravaged the cities of the Golden Horde. Uh, so that's how the, the chronology uh, occurred proving that the system had, could temporarily reinstate itself because, again, these this campaigns were often exhausting. There was a lot of back and forth. There was a lot of uh, allegiance switching and compaction and recompaction. But the blows that arrived from, in fact, massive you know, op- open field defeats uh, and uh, incursions, etc., could not quite be recovered on the longer run. In fact, this is literally the last tail strike of the Golden Horde, which um, 
but uh, simply uh, disintegrate. It would be the uh, actual canate of Crimea uh, to to finish it off, right? At that point, as we've seen in the previous video with with the Ottomans, uh, actually, you know, giving them a uh, an important uh, support, not necessarily just or in that specifically, but um, with essentially the 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 exhaustion of um, the system per se because they these regions were not immediately occupied by the Rus right it would take other centuries before uh, the Tsars managed to to essentially take one by one different Alan posts here we're looking at I don't know think of places like Kazan or that this had been quite active um, in uh, the time of of, uh, of the Golden War it would take a very gradual time for the the Rus that had also been shattered by the same Mongol invasions to to actually become that powerful in, in the modern age in the same areas that um, had been the ones of the Horde. Um, so the tides t do turn, but gr very gradually, especially in this area, because in that case uh, the Rus themselves were tied to the Mongol uh, aristocracy, they married into one another, um, they their armies were actually not that different um, as uh, we have often been uh, observing the um, horde um, was at this point uh, crumbling also for the the general damage uh, that the you can say the infrastructure had um, been uh, receiving from this continuous wars namely the uh, trade routes and the the the, the great markets uh, the, um, the this system that basically had started to gradually acquire greater um, your say uh, urban uh, urban direction right uh, as far as especially international trade in fact was concerned right the um, the the devastations of the war would render these routes less secure. They wouldn't be so important naturally uh, for how the the, the Pax Mongolica uh, had uh, rendered them, uh, because the same uh, political fragmentation of the empire uh, rendered it more costly to simply cross these lands um, and for say uh, local rulers to simply. Uh, control vast spaces over which they could exact also relatively smaller tolls, right? Every lord locally was now ever more entrenched and somehow um, defective compared to this broader uh, ambitions were being lost um, uh, over time. Simply there weren't resources, right? It made lots of videos about the 14th century crisis and the the shrinking again of, of the the range of political and territorial control of basically any power involved here unless it was nominal right uh, also in central europe and eastern europe we see it there are enormous uh, powers at this point i made a video about the europa jagellonica for example gives you an idea properly that the, the enormous spaces that could be covered namely just by saying okay let, let's say that a guy living in another country is our king um, and let's just broker with him some sort of deal uh, so that we can remain decentralized uh, in this sense. Well, in Eastern Europe, too, especially in the areas uh, now most of the Rus and this ones of the, of the Golden Horde, um, that sense of um, unity did not exist. If anything, because of the different background of these very powers, the fact that, again, from one side it was the steppes, from the other the, the forests, and so what we witness too is just the uh, the ultimate um, shrinking uh, fragmentation and, and and collapse of the the last great truly Mongol vestige uh, of, of uh, at least of the great of the Oceanic Empire of the King Gids at um, that point. The same goes actually for um, and for Timur's own empire, which disintegrated after, uh, right after his death, right? This is not to say that it depended just on the um, uh, collab on an alleged collab collapse of trade per se. Trade existed still, but having 
large-scale manufacturers, for example, associated with, with trade, having the possibility through them to centralize, even just to, to pay, to equip your, your forces, right? This is the days of simple um, ravages just to keep those powers alive. We're over, or at least they were um, just the dimension of, uh, of a power's weakness because they, they didn't have basically any other system to, to, to concentrate power locally. Right by looting resources from some somewhere else. Right. So as we were saying before, even when we look at the lands of of Timur that Timur conquered uh, throughout his extraordinary life, you um, you actually appreciate the the instability uh, of of the systems. Um, you appreciate the value of these great steps commanders. You understand that it was a, a true and deep, and this this we we do not understand in the West so much like uh, admiration for the um, in fact the ecumenic nature of, of the Mongol Empire, right? We naturally root with Rome because that throughout lived throughout the Middle Ages and beyond with the empire, namely uh, uh, these guys had had in their history basically as the largest accomplishment, the Mongol rule. And, and it was so powerful that even the Ottomans, for example, were quite um, quite um, revering uh, towards uh, this, this, this idea. The same Khanate um, of, of uh, Crimea was surely a, a client state, um, but tributed the, the honors for essentially some of a consistent part of, of its establishment still leaving the the older ways right we will see better these powers uh in other videos but uh i also made a lot a lot about tatar warfare that now you you is is already available um admittedly uh timur's grandson ruled up to the late 16th century uh and even in a series of usually at least vast and flourishing states. These are the same places of uh, the older Transoxiana of, uh, say, uh, we will see now essentially in the, the, the broader world between Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, uh, Turkmenistan, etc. That um, had always been a bit in between. That Persian sanitary uh, culture and the, say, the, the Turco-Mongol nomadic one um, and were truly important because at least trans transcontinental route, in spite of uh, the Europeans gradually opening the, the Atlantic uh, ones and then also the Indian ones, um, were, um, were still functioning, right? And wouldn't quite immediately decline uh, just per se. But it, they had been receiving a heavy blow from, from the collapse of the empire, from the Black Death, uh, and so on. There was uh, still uh, trouble, however, uh, brewing further north, right? Because the, the waves of nomads that could come to threaten these more settled um, powers um, in, in the West uh, well, it was not over, right? For example, in the 20s of the uh, 15th century, in the city of Tura, on the Tobol River, the Uzbek Khanate was proclaimed, from which in the mid-15th century a group of tribes would br break away once again. From the last secession, interestingly enough, another power was born, because the renegades that had uh, in fact fled the system uh, founded another uh, independent nomadic Khanate called the Uzbek Kazakh, or just the Kazakh, telling the truth, um, this term, that as you know is also an ethnonym, um, seemingly referred, there are different hypotheses, but it actually res uh, refers to what it seems to those having no suzerain, right? So, a sort of, you see this sort of um, anarchic breakaway that is also typical of the moment of civilizational crisis. These are um, essentially uh, 
stating this because they are also some lower type of troopers like the Kazakhs are uh, let's say a broader uh, umbrella term to aside from the you know the eventually the historical identity to form the form towards a national one uh, for a set of peoples that were in fact just renegades right more of the years so actually the scum that you know more um you know, I iconically, like, you could hire everywhere, <laughs> practically in all this world, including in Europe, as just this um, cheap, not really throwaway, but still, you know, somewhat, uh, in fact, convenient um, horse archers, uh, plus some leader, of course, that um, could harass uh, the enemy, could just keep, uh, you know, uh, you know, looting and uh, destroying and somehow creating mess in this kind of anarchic, kind of dark tonic mentality, which naturally was very far from instead the one of the celestial ruler um, that had been the the the, the can of, of cans per se. And we we find similar things also in uh, in Europe as a consequence of the. Um, of the 14th century crisis. I mean, think about all those uh, free booters, companies, uh, mercenaries, etc., that simply started to, to to also simply live like that from a previous background because of the political and social crisis, the political fragmentation, the the shrinking of the of the universal powers. Um, so you see these parallels uh, corresponding to that kind of political. Uh, degradation uh, at the end of the day. Um, in any case, this other Kazakh Khanate Ka emerged and surely it developed its own more Apollonian uh, ideals. Like the, the Kazakhs retained surely their nomadic ways so because the spaces that, where they dwelled were more suited for it and being the worst ones, uh, unsurprisingly. While the, um, the Uzbek Khans moved southwards against the cities and oases of Central Asia and conquered them. So those were the better places. In other words, again, you have the more developed power that opts for civilization and the, the, kind, of, the kind of the secondary one always complaining about this terrible elite and hierarchy uh, that wants to, you know, uh, take away freedom from the, the average people and they do not accomplish as much, of course, as civilization. Um, Maybe I am I am speaking like uh, you know old grandpa you know thinking about you know the, the days of glory uh, when true men picked uh, weapons and went serving uh, for for their fatherland or this this kind of things but the actual m meaning here I, I think is um, is actual is clear right there's there's no you see you don't, you never find an opposite outcome. <laughs> Than this, you never find the, the the cards mixed. When these phenomena occur, it, the the pattern repeats itself. Um, now, given that the series mostly takes in consideration uh, arms and armor, right? Let's pass to like this uh, this vast area. Right again, that especially in three centuries, it's impossible to just describe so compactly. But again, uh, there was a cultural similarity, if not homogeneity, especially as far as the steps was concerned, and there was an important wave, an important influence um, from the, especially the Middle Eastern um, uh, uh, world, as far as uh, the military. Uh, updating what was concerned. We'll see it now. Um, this area is, as you have understood, from stretching from the Kuban River to Isik Kul, right, where um, the um, symbiosis between Central Asian and, say, Islamic near Middle Eastern um, cultures had to uh, had um, had occurred. With the latter, however, uh, coming to prevail over the former, right? In fact, among the offensive weapons, um, we can see uh, definitely sabers, 
predominating. This had always been the case in the Turco uh, Mongol world, at least, you know, for, from a a bit like maybe not the very beginning of the Turkic uh, phase, but still when the, those waves took over, destroyed effectively the uh, the most uh, uh, advanced Indo European kind of steps or steps frontier kind of powers in in uh, in Central Asia. We see also long battle knives and daggers, uh, which um, suggest uh, a greater interest for anti-armor weapons, uh, especially at uh, closer range, almost uh, in a Western fashion. And we see an impressive amount of bows, of course, but also crossbows. Um, then spears, of course, maces, axes, um, being widely used in the late 14th century. In any case, the profile we get is more uh, foot soldiers, um, more powerful, um, let's say, uh, weapons, right? Same crossbows, even before firearms had uh, put a bit in trouble the, um, you know, the, the step horsemen. I made a bit about how the essentially the Mongols uh, on the longer run came to hire Western uh, crossbowmen uh, as mercenaries. Uh, and generally speaking, we're, we're preoccupied with the presence of these forces also in other people, in other enemies, uh, enemy armies. Um, the, the I made just recently that video about uh, the Italian uh, colonies in the in the essentially in the Black Sea and how they managed to uh, keep away mostly the, the the peoples from the interland until. And a, a keen, at least a more advanced technological, uh, Lee updated and well supplies kind of uh, army like the Ottoman one appeared and kind of managed to, to take those nests out, right? Something that the nomads could not do, instead from the from the interland. Um, uh, armor used uh, in this late early uh, late medieval early modern period across the space was. Male uh, cuirass of steel strips, body armor of plates riveted to the inner side of soft cloth, and kilted armor reinforced with metal. Uh, the overall gear is getting heavier. Um, this is, generally speaking, effective against most uh, arrow uh, fire, right? Generally speaking, metal uh, plates had been spreading for the greater effectiveness of missile fire, not just the one of gunpowder, but uh, at this point like a guy in full plate armor was not particularly upset by say um, just arrows flying normally uh, and uh, the same the, 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 the step right, that this technological advancement uh, mirrors is the one also of the uh, incapacity of the same swords uh, to simply cut now through armor, which uh, actually had never been simple, but at this w it's what they had been designed uh, structurally up to the mid 14th century, right? This causing a consistent damage to neutralize the same blade, perhaps, but still, right? Now, plate armor, uh, of course, on horseback things change because there are much greater uh, forces involved uh, than uh, than than our uh, say on, on foot but um, even uh, when you are a target of uh, enemy missile fire but uh, generally speaking they are more effective and um, the, uh, the the general say the, the 15th century is mostly the time in which uh, armor spreads the most and it's ever more necessary especially for firearms now coming around also handgunners and so on again the this world is not is primitive but it's not devoid of uh technology or, or firearms right you uh it's not just about um you know the the, the type of weapon type of weapons were were present um everywhere right uh, the proportion is important and surely guns were less available in the steps on average than among the, the sedentary uh, 
civilizations, but um, uh, they they constituted an ever more uh, impacting uh, uh, f factor in the same inter steps warfare. Right again, th this world had gradually been feudalizing as well. The the crisis had where at least the ravages had occurred the most, at least surely brought to a further destabilization of some of the sanitary dimension. But the process, for example, of fortification, of encastellation, also feudalization of the same steps powers, in some cases had, especially wherever they could put their hands on more sanitary um, uh, say communities, uh, increased as well. So if you wanted to storm these places, you surely would have met more resistance and you needed all a certain type of um, of, uh, of, of weapons, of, of techniques, uh, of in fact that cost right systemically and so that force you also to put together resources in a different way from the one you have um, been doing before. So just being the 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 wild adventurer coming from uh, the 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 bowels of the steps and coming and conquering and that simply with your with your saber and uh, and bow was was over from a consistent amount of time uh, and those who still say romantically believed in that idea were mostly emarginated right in the least uh, powerful uh, areas of the steps. Um, we see especially composite male plate armor uh, progressing uh, dramatically. This is something which apparently had originated uh, in the Golden Horde Canate, which seemed a good compromise uh, between different uh, historical traditions, right? Um, chain mail, we've seen it came actually from, from the west into the steppes in Turkic times. But given that plate armor was that expansive and not even some of the the, the greater the, of the most elite could simply afford uh, an entire plate armor, uh, which was also now complicating the maneuvers of the various units that they became that heavy. Right? Look at what was happening also in Western warfare. For think about the the, the agility required in in the steps environment. You realize why the, the solution had come about. Right, but sometimes it was literally a matter of less, uh, you know, affluence. Right, because lamellar armor was was still, uh, especially in the in the first uh, period we're covering today. There, there were other solutions uh, and more, again, traditional types uh, around. But surely the need to protect yourself more, as we were saying, just was was there. Um, that this stuff is happening also in, in Europe by a degree. I always quite. I will make a video about that of, of a Romanian source. I think it's like a sort of box or, or something that depicts a a man at arms with a full plate armor, um, or say better, a half plate armor, <laughs> because like only the the first like the from the in the waist up he had something like plate armor. His legs were not defending better, because even at least he didn't have the money to, to simply buy the fool's uh, suit, coming from probably northern Italy or, or, or something, uh, because it's typically western or in nature, like a typical Milanese or something. Um, and that is next to the steps, right? If you are from the Carpathians, uh, you have a bit of steps in Hungary, a bit of steps, and a lot of steps actually, in, in further east across the Carpathians. Well, um, you will also probably look something closer to um, to what is happening uh, in the in those spaces, um, considering that, um, especially with the rise of the Ottomans and the capacity uh, of this power to mobilize lots of peoples from as far as Central Asia, especially lighter troops, Tatars, etc. Well, you realize that. That stamp's influence is remains quite strong all over the area, right in in Hungary, in Poland, uh, and so on. Uh, still, for our region, we see hinged, articulated brassards and greaves becoming quite common. Right, so further plate um, 
for the limbs uh, and more. Um, yet there emerge also composite brassards with gauntlets and greaves with knee guards, right? Uh, that are definitely also European in model. So again, the influence of the West uh, pushing further as far as Central Asia at this point, and there is really nothing to be surprised of, given that naturally the the Middle Eastern and Central Asian forms were the the prevailing ones. But again, some of the finest armor you can find around was also uh, based on European models. Helmets were equipped with a number of defensive pieces. Um, so mirroring the, the extra, say, the strengthening of, uh, of armor. And as far as the traditional buckler used by horse archers, let's say that resilient wicker shields uh, prevailed and were enough right, for what uh, the humble uh, light uh, horsemen had to, to do. As far as the horse barding, we know of um, essentially akin methods um, for the horse armor, essentially to the to the one for the human body, right? So everything again is compact, pretty much uh, all over Eurasia, right? Towards this metal pants with padded armor underneath, as it had always been the case, though. Um, and homogenizing towards an ever more compact um, and solid protection, uh, given this in particularly increased level of, of firepower, then by the 16th century, as you know, things would be gradually abandoned. But in this world, as you know, actually look at the Caucasus of you know early 20th century Georgian knights still existing with literal male armor, still fighting with swords and all. Um, again, the lack of, say, uh, compared to the West, it took off, like with modern states, centralization, eventual industries, and so on. Here, there are less firearms, right? And they are kind of, at, at some point at least, less, um, you know, functional, um, considering that the places are more open, right? Less sparsely populated. So it all comes with, with a specific, again, political and social background said, okay, well, you know, with horse archers, we're capable of still doing something, still with the old heavy cavalry charge, also breaking the end and so on. Um, so the importance of um, firearms uh, is reduced as the one of armor is maintained, actually, as a consequence, while, as you know, by the, the end of the, the end of the 17th, the beginning of the 18th century, at least as far as line infantry is concerned, armor becomes obsolete um, altogether. Cavalry would maintain that. This is also another indicator, perhaps, that um, these countries normally had a... maintained that this, this kind of step influence idea that, first of all, they're less stable, right? They're more engulfed. In, I mean, compare, I made a bit about Napoleonic uh, Egypt, right, the campaign. Uh, there and so how uh, easily the Mamluks were taken out by French infantry at that point. I mean, of course, there was no match, but just to explain you how, let's say, the West was accelerating brutally towards another direction, and these places more or less remained le more destabilized, and consequently, the average person was also less um, less affluent, right? You can look at the ancien regime saying, oh my god, so much inequality. Yeah, okay, but overall, people were living better, they had been leaving. Um, on the longer run, because uh, just the world was more advanced than the Middle Ages, right? So um, before the bourgeois revolution, still people were technically living better, and otherwise there would have not been bourgeois revolution, just like it didn't happen in the Islamic world. Guess why, right? And so this also had to do with the prior, also a bit of step bias, again, the Turks, the Mongols, that had brought this more, auto, say, autocratic and uh, private feudal, mindset there and primitive customs and maintain the idea that there was a single leader and all the others were more or less subject and so they had broken properly their backs as far as uh, I know it sounds bad <laughs> in other ways you know um, but in part it was exactly this think about military slavery the Mamluks uh, etc in fact um, and so it's a mental 
predisposition. Think about the concept of Islam, literally meaning, you know, subjection, right? So it's something, say, that doesn't matter how, you know, in the Shi'at basis as it was derived from the Indo-European Sasanian holy war, and etc. But this is the point I always say. It doesn't take just to be traditional. It takes to be actually morally loaded, right? You can have a sclerotic traditional system where there is nothing working with that. So just the form, uh, just the, the form, but no substance for that matter. Um, sometimes the problem is also a lot of substance, no form. But again, form eventually is, uh, you know, shaped at, at some point. But anyway, now in, in the 15th century, uh, under the influence of the Near East, um, the pattern of armament for the next two centuries was laid down. Uh, we mentioned the Sultanate of Egypt was extremely powerful, it was much more Western in nature at this point. The Mamluks and the Venetians have the most advanced uh, artillery technology, for example. Um, and so th this is largely also what the Ottomans inherit for crushing the much more feudal Persian, Mongol kind of uh, culturally based um, army at uh, Khalid Iran. So, in a sense, of course, the the Mediterranean keeps pouring civilization, and of course, the the Middle East per se was not as advanced, was not as performing, right? Consider the Ilkhanate had been, in fact, the, the Mongol rule of Persia. So again, lots of styles. Even I made videos about the Ilkhan horsemen uh, and army organization. We'll keep talking about the stuff. Um, as advanced as they were, say, by the 13th or early 14th century, from the second half began to decline consistently. And this is the great difference with the West really, uh, right, if we use that as a term as a, of, comp uh, of comparison, uh, the West was dramatically more resourceful in all this, but with coping with the great crisis of, of the 14th century. Um, it's, um, say, new, new types of sabers, daggers emerge, right, battle picks would become widespread. European forms are, at that point, um, rejected instead, because, again, the, the wave poured from the say the Mamluks from the uh, later from the Ottomans is um, per se just like um, its own type that is not that is more I was, we just said closer let's say as from a military system to, to the west but also has its own styles and still consistent Turco-Mongol influence um, gauntlets were abandoned the legs were covered with paddle-shaped armors of iron strips, mail or plates attached to the girdle. Um, in the late 15th and the early 16th century, mail plate armor became predominant as a combination, though the armor made of plates riveted to the inner side of a sort of cloth as well as simple mail were quite popular as well. Uh, we see a further spread of firearms, cannons, and handguns. Um, consider that after um, the, uh, the, the we've seen the Golden Horde had had a, an important uh, in the Crimean Khanate at some point. It had an important arms and armor production, but after the ravages of Timur, the raids of the Uzbeks and the Kazakhs. Um, so places like the Golden Horde, Central Asia, to a considerable extent, had been spent. Right, that's the point we make. And that this great tidal wave of Mongol forces actually came with, eventually to, to, to bring all that force somewhere else. Right, and kind of overwhelming uh, at its passage. The Mongols themselves. Uh, originally had, even at the time of the Great Conquest, we know it archaeologically, didn't have such a dramatically advanced uh, arms and armor, technologically speaking. They were just good for the type of warfare that they made, and of course, they had a great moral force and a collective training, and as a consequence, they were pretty damn punching and strong and, you know, um, capable of carrying out what they did. 
but while again the, when the crisis happened civilization was best equipped um and and central asia once again was kind of declining in comparison um and so much because there is a plateau right uh it's not just uh to uh, uh there's a plateau uh, beyond which there is nothing there is annihilation Right, so in some areas were really that hit, that lost their own, their own, consistently a great amount of surplus, and so so that relative importance they had had in terms of arms and armor production in um, in earlier times, where they really had actually come up with impressive stuff um, over the over the millennia. But this is the end, practically. And sadly, to a degree, there are, as we will see, there are further improvements. But uh, later on, they are mostly externally uh, induced, right? Not just say a, a way the locals began to cope with the outer side as it had been before, but literally, you know, buying arms and armor for, from from the from the neighbors. Uh, for some kind of local production remained, but the uh, let's say the the scale of manufacturers uh, and also of high quality armaments um, switched already at this point uh, over instead to using important Iranian, Turkish, and Indian weapons uh, that were by this point. Uh, or more effective, more uh, even just manufactured in larger quantities, so that they wouldn't, of course, get necessarily the very best unless they were like properly the elite. Um, but even in that case, you could find very primitive or anachronistic things uh, in use, and that's again normal, right? It's just that modernity accelerates dramatically, and lots of these peoples uh, are. Even if at the time probably they didn't recognize the, the full extent uh, to which this could reach, um, like they probably began to feel the pressure, they began to feel the sense of um, inadequacy, the fact that it had been surpassed, or at least that the time of their great rule in the step was was over. And this is a very um, dramatic uh, moment. Like, as you know, uh, you know, here we do not make um, cultural victimism. Ah, the poor natives that were exterminated and conquered. Well, with, what were those peoples actually doing <laughs> throughout their entire existence? Here, tradition speaks clearly. Um, the most successful countries were simply the most advanced ones. Morally, above all. Right, it's not a matter of technique or whatever. You can have, even individually, of course. This, I don't know, a Kazakh horseman was surely, you know, a person capable of living in appalling conditions, um, surviving. Starting read uh, Dersu Zala, or you know, just that's not a Kazakh, but uh, just to make you understand how, in the age of positivism, in the nineteenth and the twentieth century, like. We came to, 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 to look at natives uh, for for a sort of caricature uh, of of these cultures, and we, and the reason being that that literature, that point of observation, didn't stem from the Western elite anymore. It stemmed from the Western fort estate. It, it it emerged from people that had no idea what the history of the steppes was, like not even the one of I don't know of Native Americans. Uh, uh, say I call them natives, but I also repulse by the concept of that of that sort of nativity, for that matter, to the places which is bullshit. Um, and um, the the sense being, we must understand how and why this was and how it happened, rather than um, because that makes it much all much clearer, if anything, in historical perspective, but uh, also in a moral sense cannot simply turn away and make it a matter of uh, 
you know, it's just the, the, this poor babies that lived in these places before the terrible Westerners arrived. It's bullshit, right? Even though in this case we're talking mostly about Russians that, of course, weren't really the best of the West, uh, to say the least. But um, in the uh, in the and there were half nomads, say at least in, in cultural legacy for for what effectively the Moscovy rose up uh, at the time of, of the of the of course of the Golden Horde. But um the the sense being of course that this struggle had been going on forever and it finally was won by the centuries. That's it. Right? It's as brutal as it sounds, uh, the consequences are under everybody's eyes to see. Um and we will surely look at them more closely, uh, hopefully, in the next chapters. Um, because they gave origin also to some kind of, um, of solutions, of compromises, of, um, let's say, of military cultures that, very interestingly enough, were also deriving... Uh, from a process of nomadization of the Europeans that had occurred uh, in Eastern Europe especially. And this would be interesting to, to see even in the Islamic world where it's a bit less known um, for this at least. Uh, but um, generally speaking, the mm, uh, think of, of the Cossacks. Think of that aforementioned sense of anarchic primitivism and how important this was for countries like I don't know the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth or how uh, other peoples uh, you know came to uh, to generally speaking you know cope with this more decentralized uh, communities that were living a bit still the older ways I made a video also about the Lipka Tartars that are the contrary of that. So basically, people this this had also been going on forever, as you know. Um, that case, Tartars that had settled in places like Lithuania, Poland, and that constituted just a on the longer run. It, 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 today, are part of, of those countries' identity for that matter, aside from the various uh, ethnic. Uh, say upheavals of of the 20th century, to a degree we're looking at uh, the relics of a millinery history of stamp warfare, and that at some point was also of dominance, at least in some fields, uh, and that came deeply to intertwine with the history of uh, of of the rest of the world. There is no way to put it right. It, it's impressive. Uh, we all descend from these people. There is no doubt, but at least you know, in Europe, as far as you think, of course, that the Americans didn't have the horse back then. Um, but uh, so, and all the culture that had s uh, spread from that, but surely in Europe, basically uh, across all of Eurasia, even parts of, of Africa, of course, uh, large parts of Africa, telling the truth, um, are, are there, right? We at least descend prepotently in moral, cultural, and ethnic legacy from the steppes peoples. Uh, and we were, at some point, uh, truly a uh, substantial part of our ancestors came from there. So it, it's, it's really impressive. It's a story that must be told because it's counterintuitive. It's not about the 21st century kind of exalted kid sense of Oh my God! Uh, I want to be like them. I descend from them. I made a genetic test. And this bullshit. This has to do with the with ecumenic, um, properly Catholic, imperial, traditional power, right? This has. This is the truest meaning of of existence. If you get down to it, and how what, how these peoples responded to that, and what they were capable of doing from a condition of minority. Because they managed to take over culturally much larger peoples than them, uh, so much that we still speak their language, uh, and that's that's impressive, really. 
in any case um, for today I stop it here I uh, just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye